Hello, my friends. This is Lindy. Welcome to my channel, Lindy's Magpie Reads. So, Friday Reads, got lots of things to tell you about, starting with my bookish adventures this week. I saw a fabulous play, The Innocence of Trees. It's written by Eugene Stickland, and it is still on for a few more nights here in Edmonton. So uh, I know I have some subscribers who live in the same city as I do. I highly recommend this. It is about the artist Agnes Martin, who lived with schizophrenia. And the depiction of schizophrenia was so well done. It's a very moving play I loved it. We also had our monthly literary salon this week and the theme was Breaking Bread. So the poem that I chose to contribute is one from this book, The Best of the Best New Zealand Poems, and the poem that I read is by Fiona Farrell and it's called Our Trip to Takaka. I'm not going to read the poem for you, but if you're not familiar with Fiona Farrell, she's also written fiction as well as poetry and check her out. Yeah, you won't be sorry. I also attended a Zoom event called Voices, an Indigenous Reading and Learning Circle. I'm going to link the information down below because it's available um, for anybody to watch and it is about Indigenous language learning and I learned that the Calgary Public Library has been instrumental in getting children's picture books created that have the dual languages so that educators can use them and I got a couple out from my local library just to see what they're like so I will show them to you And I'm not going to try and say the Blackfoot words, nor the Nakoda stony words. Uh, the language is called Iyafka. I lived on the Morley Reserve when I was a kid, several times for several stretches of time because my dad was doing construction on the reserve. And uh, when I was in grade six, I was there for six months. So half of my year of schooling and my siblings also, uh, we were living in Morley. I did not know that the reserve has a new name, uh, an Ithka name, and that is Minitni. It was so interesting to hear about these language initiatives and I wish them every success. Later today I am going to a poetry event called Literary Ecologies. Poetry, Conversation, Interventions in the Environmental Emergency. Three poets and it's at 4 p.m. this afternoon at Audrey's Books, so I am going to try and get this Friday Reads edited before that. Okay, on to the six books that I finished this week. Starting with this work of graphic nonfiction, Feelings, A Story in Seasons by Manjit Thap. She is a South Asian British illustrator and I was already familiar with her work because she did the illustrations for Julia Pierpont's The Little Book of Feminist Saints. I talked about that book in a video I did way back in March. And she also did the cover for Vivek Shreya's The Subtweet, a book that I absolutely adore. So her work is really distinctive. She uses rich colors and textures, and this story is about 
seasonal affective disorder, a mood disorder that is tied to uh, the seasons. And it, uh, people who have it mostly experience it during the winter months. And that is the case with me. I have seasonal affective disorder. Anyway, one thing I noticed in this book is that uh, almost all of the people that she portrays are women. Uh, there's a couple of times where it's a man that we see from behind. Actually, there's only one time that I'm positive that it's a man because he's wearing a suit and uh, he appears to be her boss or her colleague telling her that she needs to smile. When you have a mood disorder, that doesn't help. <laughs> I really enjoyed this. I gave it four and a half stars. It was a reminder to myself that this problem that I'm having with sleeping these days is tied to that mood disorder that I have. Today's short story from the short story advent calendar is by Diane Champerlin. It's called Night Flight. And I just want to read you a taste. What kind of fools are we to go there willingly, night after night after night, believing that sleep will come, believing that sleep will save us, still believing that sleep will indeed knit up the raveled sleeve of care. Remember that the instruments of knitting are needles. Remember your mother knitting yet another pair of mittens, purple this time, to replace the green ones you lost last week. Remember what she always said, don't you touch those needles. You'll poke your eye out. What kind of fools are we to close our eyes on the darkness and expect it to stay there, right where we left it? Any of you insomniacs <laughs> might be able to identify. Next up is a picture book, A Map Into the World. It is written by a Hmong American writer, Kao Kalia Yang. And the illustrations are uh, by a Korean illustrator, Seo Kim. Uh, the reason I picked it up is because one of my subscribers, Curious Hmm, I don't know Curious Hmm's gender or pronouns or anything like that, uh, but they recommended this author's memoir of their father, the song poet, I think is the title. Anyway, uh, that one isn't available at my public library, but I saw that she had written this picture book. I'm so glad that I picked it up, so thank you, Curious Hmm. It's got all of these features that make a picture book special. Starting the story right on the end papers. You can see that it is a story cloth, uh, traditional needlework that is uh, unique to Hmong culture. And there's a little author's note at the beginning that explains. The story cloth is called Ba Ndao which is also a girl's name, and the girl in this story is called Batendao. This little girl loves nature. She's an artist. It's a story about the cycle of life. You can see that her mother is pregnant when they first buy this house. Uh, it's also a story that goes through the seasons. Leaves change color finds a little, the first worm in the spring, and she calls it Annette. And it's also a story about grief. She has, they have two elderly neighbors across the street, and in the winter the woman dies, and the next summer, Patendau makes some art for him. And she explains in a whisper, it's a map into the world, just in case you need it. And 
Bob said, I think I might. Lovely story about the importance of community. Next up is a book of poetry by Joelle Taylor. It's called Kunto and Othered Poems. This won the uh, T.S. Eliot Prize in 2021. Joelle Taylor is a butch lesbian who came out in the early 80s. I came out in the late 70s. I have loved many butches <laughs> in my life. That was one of the reasons why I love this book. Lesbian culture is different in the UK, in London, but there's an author's note at the beginning that explains the lesbian slang and talks about the names of all of the lesbian bars that there used to be. She says in the preface, as a young teenager stepping tentatively out of the closet in the early 1980s, I was subjected to constant state-endorsed abuse, spat at in school, punched in the back of the head while walking home, attacked on buses, chased from bars, followed home by whistling men, to name a few. I wear the abuse as a suit. There is no part of a butch lesbian that is welcome in this world. It was bad when I was a teenager, it is as bad today. While this book is set in what is now thought of as the golden age of the gay, we have regressed as a community. Our meeting places, clubs, and bars have closed, and we gather in distinct flocks across social media, each flock speaking a different language. And there's more. You can find uh, Joelle Taylor reading excerpts from this online. I will link to her performing um, the title poem, Kunto, down in the notes below. And next up is an audiobook by Ian Reid, Canadian author, called We Spread. The audiobook is read by Robin Miles. She is an audiobook narrator that I love to listen to. And I'm so glad that she was the one reading this because the style of the writing, it's in the voice of Penny, uh, an aging woman who is living alone in her apartment uh, until she has a fall and after that she goes into a care home. Now, her voice is very impassive. Um, she is suspicious. And you can't tell whether she's a reliable narrator or not. Now, things at the home that she's moved to seem a little off. So again, how can we tell whether this is, you know, some kind of psychological horror or whether it's Penny's own mind that is playing tricks on her? I knew the premise um, and I, when I heard the author talk, uh, read from the book at the Vancouver Writers' Fest, I didn't care for the passage that he read and I thought, oh, maybe that's just his reading uh, because then when I looked at the description of the book again, I thought, I am very interested in the way that aging people are treated in society and how they become um, sort of invisible and they're put into care homes and uh, marginalized, definitely marginalized. So I'm warning you, this story has got a very slow pace. It was not a long book, I think it's about five hours in audio, but still uh, if it wasn't for Robin Miles, I don't think I would have persevered, although I'm glad that I did. I don't know, three stars, three and a half stars. If you are a person who needs a strong plot, this book is not for you. And next up is another audiobook. Random House Canada presents Rehearsals for Living by Robin Maynard and Leanne Gudasimuse Simpson read for you by the authors. I included this little clip 
because I wanted you to hear Leanne say her name. Robin Maynard is a, a Black Canadian writer and scholar. She wrote Policing Black Lives. Leanne Badassamose Simpson is a Indigenous Anishinaabe writer, activist, musician. And starting in 2020, they were writing letters back and forth to each other, which have since been edited and published. So their lives as decolonial activists uh, is in the forefront here, as well as raising their children in, in the ways of Indigenous resistance. They're comparing the connections between the ways that Black people and Indigenous people have so much in common. They talk about the climate crisis being tethered to its origins in slavery and colonialism. Um, one of the things that Leanne says is, this is called the Anthropocene, but that's an affront. Human has never been a politically neutral category. They talk about the Black Lives Matter movement as it's happening and the push to defund the police. They reference many important authors like Audre Lorde and Dion Brand. Uh, it's a, a highly intellectual, bracing narrative that emphasizes knowledge, research, analysis, and you can tell that it comes from um, the deep love for the land, their families, and their cultures. This is one that I'm thinking of purchasing a copy so that I can refer back to it. And the same thing with the last book that I'm going to tell you about, Why Indigenous Literatures Matter by Daniel Heath Justice. So I did this one as a audio and book combo. I first checked this book out when it was originally published. I don't know if that was 2018, 2019 maybe. Yeah, it was, it was originally published in 2018. And I found that the, the time that I had it out from the library, um, I wasn't in the right frame of mind for the intellectual rigor that's in it. So when I saw that there was an audiobook edition, I jumped on that and I started, I had to renew it. So I've had it out for about six weeks now because there is so much in it and so many references to Indigenous authors, including at the back, uh, there's an appendix, a year of hashtag honoring Indigenous writers uh, that Daniel Heath Justice did from January 1st to 31st of December in 2016 on Twitter, every day talking about a different Indigenous writer from around the world. And what a fabulous resource if you're in, interested in Indigenous writing. Daniel Heath Justice is Cherokee and he now lives in Canada. He's gay. In his preface, he says, this is a book about stories and some of the ways they matter. It's about the many kinds of stories Indigenous peoples tell and the stories others tell about us. It's about how these diverse stories can strengthen, wound, or utterly erase our humanity and connections, and how our stories are expressed or repressed, shared or isolated, recognized or dismissed. It's about the ways we understand that vexed and vexing idea of literature 
and how assumptions about what is or is not literary are used to privilege some voices and ignore others. Once I got going in this, I found it so engaging that even the final appendix, which is a, a bibliographic essay talking about uh, more information about all of the reference he, references he has in the book, was so interesting that I continued listening. And you can hear a little bit of it in the final clip that I will show you where I'm working on a puzzle. I'm inserting this little bit because I forgot to mention the audio recording came out in 2020 and there are some changes from the original book, most notably that uh, uh, the author Gwen Benaway, who in 2020 we learned is not Indigenous, uh, so her name was removed from the book. Uh, I guess there's always updates that need to be made. Thanks everyone for watching. I always appreciate your comments and look forward to what you've got to say. Bye for now. His death notice, pages 113 through 14. Simon's observations about Indians, page 102. My previous discussion of the book is in Our Fire Survives the Storm. The Cherokee Literary History, University of Minnesota Press, 2006, pages 179 through 94. Warren Carew's comments about that which remains can be found in Going to Canada, the foreword to Across Cultures, Across Borders, Canadian Aboriginal and Native American Literatures, edited by Paul De Pasquale, Renata Eigenbrod, and Emma LaRook, Broadview Press, 10, page 21. Thomas King's explanation for why Indigenous writers focus on the contemporary is found in The Truth About Stories, page 106. The citation to Forger's letter to the Blackfoot Agency agent comes from Keith D. Smith's collection, Strange Visitors, Documents in Indigenous Settler Relations in Canada from 1876, University of Toronto Press, 2014, pages 87 through 88. Most citations of E. Pauline Johnson's work are from Marjorie Fee and Dory Nason's very fine edited collection, Taga Hayan Wage, E. Pauline Johnson's Writings on Native North America, from Broadview, 2016. The Cattle Thief, page 137. A Cry from an Indian Wife, pages 131 through 33. The Man in the Chrysanthemum Land is in Taga Hayan Wage, Collected Poems and Selected Prose. Edited by Carol Gerson and Veronica Strong Boag, University of Toronto Press, 2002, pages 152 through 53.